It's a great pleasure to have uh, Dr. Mark Schneider from uh, uh, Cosmology Group from Mark Max Planck Institute for Gravitational Physics, Albert Einstein Institute, Potsdam, where I was working uh, just a month ago. I left, not month, even one week ago. Um, he's working as a postdoc there. Before he uh, did his uh, PhD and master's from uh, LMU Munich uh, with Professor uh, Hoffman. And uh, uh, then he shifted uh, for his pa uh, first postdoc at Pennsylvania State University where he had a chance with work with prof the great professor Abhay Ashtekar. He worked for two years in a very interesting topic, which is uh, the dynamical horizon. And he will teach us, teach all of us, what dynamical horizon actually means because we mostly don't consider this kind of possibilities when we write GR or the applications of GR in different contexts. So we try to learn this new topic from Mark and uh, we will ask as many as questions we want. So Mark, thank you for uh, agreeing to give this talk for this very small note notice. Uh, I just approached because I know that your talk was ready, that's why. Uh, and uh, this is the 55th QASTM seminar. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, yeah, like we all uh, feeling very happy that you are giving this talk. And because this is something we want, uh, we want to learn this new topic. And hopefully we can learn something from this uh, talk. And you can start, please. Thank you very much for this nice introduction and also for the invitation. Um, although it came with a very short notice, um, I have to say, so I prepared the talk within three days. I also moved house. So um, if there is something which is not clear, please let me know because um, I try to be as uh, basic as Mark, possible. So we want what we are doing is loudly. Your voice is very uh, low. Oh, I can also put the headphones if it's better than. Yeah. Okay, I put the headphones. Um, yeah. Okay. Now, now it's better. It's a bit better. Better now. It's a better. Yeah. Okay. Good. Um, okay, so I will basically uh, review horizons in general relativity. That means we have to do a lot of GR, a lot of um, differential geometry, but I will try to explain it such that um, you also get the intuition. And uh, the topic we want to address today is horizons. And first we start with the intuition. Yeah, so that we have at least a picture in our mind, what can a horizon be? So let's, let's draw a picture. That's always the best thing. When we do geometry, is the best thing is drawing a picture. Uh, so we have a space time, and we can define something like a throat, as you know from the black hole. I assume that there is a basic GR knowledge. So um, if there is something unclear, just ask me. That's not a that's Yeah, not a Mark, uh, sorry for the interruction. Uh, yes. Everything is OK. You just speak a little bit loud. OK. OK, but I have the microphone. OK, I will try to speak louder. And um, OK, so we have some manifold here, which has some throat like a black hole. And um, yeah, we can place observers here. Uh, so we can place here a person, here one person. Um, those are gender neutral person for those who are interested in that. Um, but what we can see is those people can communicate in principle, but here there occurs a problem because we have non-trivial curvature. And um, so what we want to define is we want to look at how people communicate. So let's see, we can draw a line here, a line here, and a line here. So those people can, in principle, want to communicate, but um, we have to check whether they can or whether they can't. Um, so we give them names like A, B, uh, 
and C. So A and B can communicate um, uh, very good. And I want to say, in order to, to understand what I call space-time, we'll call space-time for now, and we will keep this idea, space-time is a collection of events. And events are basically uh, something which is located at the coordinate t and x. x here defines just the spatial coordinates. OK, so what we can find here is, when we take the black hole as an example, that, yeah, as you know, that black hole has a horizon. And we can say, well, let's put c such that c is inside the, horizon, the black hole. That means this is the horizon here. We will define what is a horizon later, but just to get an intuition, um, what can we call black hole? So it is easy to see that A and B can communicate um, because, yeah, there's nothing wrong. Outside the black hole, of course, you can communicate. That's not a problem. We can communicate, although, the, although there's a uh, uh, the black hole in the center of our galaxy. So that's not an issue. But as we see, A might be communicating with C and B also, but C can never communicate with the others. So we see here that there's a problem and C cannot communicate with uh, the others. So the question is, what is communication? That we have to define. And to define communication, Sorry, and communication. Um, we use commu commutation, communication. We use um, that some events are joined by non-space-like curves. That means non-space-like curves are curves on which this, uh, the traveling speed is smaller or equal than the speed of light. That means light-like signals or space-like signals, yeah? Um, and this we call communication by on space-like curves. Space-like would correspond to, for sure, communication, which is faster than the speed of light, but that's uh, for sure not causal. Um, yeah. Curves. Okay. So therefore, we can define the black hole or the horizon, not defined, but um, we can think about the horizon from intuition as the border of communication. So that is the basic idea. And this is something we want to um, now formalize, right? So what we can say is that the horizon structures a manifold into several different parts. One part is, for example, here, the interior part. There, you cannot communicate with the outside part. So the communication is blocked. This part here is a part is like something we live in. So um, we can perfectly communicate at the horizon. There is exactly the border. So we see there's a uh, structure going on with respect to the causal uh, causality of the space time. So the goal is now to um, formalize this. Yeah. Um, I have nodes which are extended. And um, so you don't need to write something down, but um, formalize the above statement. And we will first start with um, using the definition of the book of Hawking and Ellis, which I consider as the best and hardest GR book of all times. But um, once you, you, you go through all the pain, you will understand a lot. I, I don't say I understood everything, but um, I just want to say, um, when you start, it is illuminating. Mark read the whole book. <laughs> I read the whole book, yes. But I don't say I understood the whole book. <laughs> so let's start with causal structure. Causal structure, we need to identify and to define uh, the event horizon. First, we'll start with the 
notion of horizon before we go to the dynamic horizon because we will appreciate more the notion of dynamic horizon when we understand how unphysical, I'll define unphysical later, the notion of an event horizon actually is. So I can only give a short introduction into this and um, very briefly because I cannot uh, when I explain the whole causal structure, we will sit here for 20 hours. So therefore, I will only explain the most important notions which we need to understand what an event horizon is. Okay, so let's start with a definition. Um, so one is a space-time. Space-time should be somehow clear. Um, space-time, oh, what's that one? Cool. Um, So space-time is just a doublet consisting of um, ah, I can be fast or slower. This is um, as you want. So we can we can adjust uh, adjust to each other. Consisting of uh, a smooth manifold, smooth connected connected semi Riemannian manifold. Um, this is not essential that it's in order to define a space time that it's semi Riemannian, but uh, that's just how we now define it. We can also call it sometimes Lorentzian. We need this in order to define a causal structure because just Riemannian don't have a light cone, therefore they don't have a causal structure. We'll see later um, why this is the case. Um, uh, Riemannian consisting of Riemannian manifold M and a metric G. Okay, that's kind of basic definition. Uh, probably you all know that. And we will assume the following um, global assumptions, global properties. So one thing is um, space time. This is now my abbreviation for space time. Um, so space time is orientable. Orientable means I can form normals to surfaces and time orientable. This means that I can divide the space time into future and past. Yeah. So that means we can, what we can do is we can define light codes like we have uh, at some point. We can define curves like uh, this. They should be, oh my God. This is future directed and this is past directed. Yeah, and those are the nuns here. Okay, so just uh, as a reminder, what is what are these causal um, separations? So we can, we consider two vectors. Consider X and Y. Um, and their separation is yeah, time-like if the metric contracted with those thing with those two is smaller zero it is uh, it is now if this is zero and space-like if it is, yeah, the opposite sign. And those two we'll call causal curves because those are the signals, this is communication. Those are the signals which travel uh, with speed of light or with a velocity which is smaller than speed of light. Yeah, so causal curves are then defined by this is smaller or equal to zero. This is important to understand what a causal structure is and how to define initial conditions also. And um, I think the easiest example is when we want to... You want to mean inside the light cone. Yes, exactly, exactly. So those are all the curves like, uh, yeah. Now curves are the curves which go here, which are the boundary of the light cone. And uh, time-like curves move like this. 
yeah so everything we like inside that cone or uh, if touches the boundary so you are meaning that the yes yes that. also in the past right the same, yeah. yes and the space like separation would be something like this exactly okay so now we want to define some causal sets in order to understand how to define the event horizon. Yeah. And uh, so first we start with Minkowski, which is a super easy space term. Um, we'll call it the manifold M4 and the metric eta. And we take two sets, which is one we call S and the other one U. And now we can define the first causal set of uh, Minkowski. Again, a definition. And this one is the chronological future. There is a chronological past, which is um, chronological, which is defined in the same sense, chronological future. This is called I plus SU. Yeah, um, of S, this is where we start relative to U. So those concepts are really general and uh, they're not easy to digest. So if it's not yet 100% clear, it might be some time to think about it. And you can also send me a message uh, when, when it's unclear and we can talk about it. That's, that's not an issue. Um, so is the set um, of all points. points in U, um, which can be reached. I'm sorry that I'm writing so, so much, but um, it is important to be one time very accurate, reached uh, from S by future directed True, directed, time-like curves. In you. Okay, so what does it mean? This is when you think about the light cone we have drawn. Um, yeah, we can just look at that. Let's take S to be just that part. Um, so those are all the future directed time-like curves are when you think about the light cone, what Shantan said correctly, those are all the curves which are inside here. Those are all the cause curves which connect two sets. Yeah. And um, there is a condition that those curves must have non-zero length. So they have to be length which is non-zero um, or to be defined. You can prove that this is an open set and you can define the chronological past accordingly. Yeah, chronological past is then um, just defined as square minus s u. Yeah, and um, yeah, so this thing is rather basic. It tells us, okay, I have two sets. They can communicate with each other um, with time-like curves. Okay, so that's nothing super fancy, um, but we want to now extended to causal curves, and that is that allows us to define the causal past, the causal future. Um, causal future, which is denoted by S U of, of S relative to U. relative to you. Um, defined as the union. So those are um, mathematical issues. I'm not sure whether we um, need to go into that detail, 
but uh, we need to understand the causal future because the causal future will tell us what the event horizon is. And then you will see that it's totally teleological because this set already is, uh, yeah, is non-local and also not dynamical. And you, which can be reached. from S by a future directed live curve in you. Okay, so what is this? This set here now, also when we look at the light count, this describes the null rays. Ah, sorry, I, I did a mistake. It's like a non-space like curve. Yeah, so this defines the null rays plus the time like curves, which are inside here. So now we have, in that sense, the light cone plus its boundary in this set. Yeah. And we can define a closure of, um, of a set, of an open set, which is just when you close it. Open set S has closure of S and uh, boundary. Boundary of S is denoted by S dot. Um, the closure times the manifold minus the set and this closure. So this, this, this if, you, if we subtract these two sets, we'll end up with the boundary of this set S because we have the closure of S minus the closure of the manifold minus S and this just leaves you um, the boundary of S. Okay, um, question so far. Mark, can you show this thing by a small representative diagram? Uh, you mean the boundary? Yeah, yes, yes, yes. Oh, yeah, we, 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 we can do that. Um, so in principle, one can, yes, one can do. So we have, let's say we have the manifold here. And uh, we take some some set S. Okay. Now we close S. Yeah. And um, yeah. So this is the closure of S. And um, then we have the closure of M minus S. So this involves when we take out, so this is the closure of S, and we can take out this, this part, then we have here, okay, so let's just put it the opposite way. Um, yeah, let's take a bit. So here was our set S. Now when we take, when we subtract S from M, we have a hole. It's not a hole in the sense of genus, but um, some parts of the manifold are missing because we have subtracted it here. Mm -hmm. But now, since we have subtracted it, this is an open set. Mm -hmm. But what we have to do is we have to, when we close this, we can also close that set. And this gives us this line, mm -hmm. right? So the, but the closure of S has this line and the subtraction of S from M has also this line. So this is when we have take the intersection, mm. the intersection is just that line. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. Okay. So this can be treated as the boundary of this thing. Exactly. The leftover is just the boundary of this set S. We can do this for every set. And those sets J and I, in principle, can be open sets. They don't need to be closed. 
Mm -hmm. And also we assume that the space-time is asymptotically, for, for now, it's asymptotically open. That's an assumption in the whole book. Um, this becomes important when we look at the boundaries of space-time, of asymptotically flat space-times like the square minus and square plus, where we define usually initial conditions, and also our observer, which tells us when and where is the event horizon. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we can, so what we have uh, we've learned now is uh, the following. We can draw a diagram and we have I plus is this interior part. Uh, J plus is the interior part plus the boundaries. And uh, for, for the light cone, we can define this boundary um, we can define the horizon, uh, not the horizon, the the, um, the boundary of the light cone, which is called future horizons, um, which is just, um, I will write it down. It's not super important, but um, it is interesting, I think. I mean, I think it's interesting. But this is not the horizon. Um, we have to be careful. So the future horizons is just the sub is just the when we subtract s from m from from j plus i plus this gives us the boundary of the light cone just the these two lines if you're interested in that and uh, yeah you can think of the the boundary of the light cone but it's not that it's not always like this because the problem is that um, in more complicated space times, this is not always so easy to understand. So those things are super delicate issues when you think about the um, singularity theorems or something like this. They are those sets all appear there, and there are a lot of more sets like the um, domain of dependence. But this is not important to define the horizon. I just want to say. Um, they are mathematically formulated such that they give a unique description of the causal structure of the space time. So some, it might look like an overkill, but it is not like this. And we skipped the boundaries so far, the asymptotic boundaries. So let's look at the boundaries. Um, we assume now the space time is asymptotically flat. Which is actually the case for Minkowski. Yeah, then we can define, we can define a chrono set uh, nevertheless. Um, and this is a very important thing. And uh, I will spend some time on this because it is important to understand this. Um, it, is it is very useful also for QFT and a lot of other things. So an acronym set is a set S for which the causal, the chronological future and the set itself is empty. Okay, what does it mean? This means that we have some set and this and in this set no points on this set are um, connected by timeline curves and that means um, when we have when we formulate initial conditions we all, always have to formulate it on a chrono sets why because when we have initial conditions and they're um, linked by timeline curves then one initial condition can causally float into another initial condition and that is a non well behaved initial value problem. So therefore, it is always important when we take measurements or we place an observer, this observer is placed on an acronym set. And otherwise, we have some, some weird stuff because we have an evolution within the observers or within the um, initial values. And uh, this, is, this is very important. And um, for asymptotically flat space times, we can define two acronym boundaries which are the future and the um, 
with a feature. And so we can define a feature and pass not infinity. they're called square plus or square minus. They usually, when you think about Minkowski space time, they're sitting here, square plus, here square minus, it's also square plus, it's also square minus. They are um, the boundary which correspond to, to uh, an affine parameter. Parameter, find parameter are the parameters which label on which position I am on a curve of an R curve with the value plus minus infinity. Yeah, minus four square minus um, plus four square, square plus. Okay, so this set is an acronym set for sure because it's a null surface here. Yeah. This is a null surface. So this is a current set. We can place an observer and initial conditions there. That's what we usually do. And now we have all the complex, uh, all the causal structure, which is enough to define the event horizon. Are there questions so far? So this structure is basically called the causal diamond or something like yes. that? Yes. Yeah, that is the causal diamond, exactly. Yeah. Any question, guys, up to this I point? Think I, I, I think I've killed them, but... Uh, it's, it's like, I think people can ask questions. If anybody have any question. Anyone, particularly? Our expert, Vaishak. <laughs> Vaishak, okay. do you have any question? No, 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 I don't have any questions. But yeah. that is it, is, we can proceed faster, that's okay. I can just define the event rise and we go into dynamical. If you are just here for the dynamical, we, yeah. As you want, I mean, I do it for you, not for me. Okay, so then I'll proceed. Okay, we can define now the event horizon. We go to Schwarzschild space time. The metric tensor is Schwarzschild horizon is called RS. And um, we have T and one minus RS R plus R square T2 omega. So this, we can draw the Penrose diagram, for example, to be like this. Okay. It, it won't be always 45 degrees, but I, I assume you know that. Okay, so now we start to define this uh, weird event horizon. So first, I, I will write the definition and then we understand and the diagram how this is, uh, what, what it means. Okay, so we call it an event horizon. And we call it the future event horizon. Is the boundary j dot minus of square plus and the closure of m, where this thing is the asymptotic closure. Asymptotic closure. Of M. Yeah, this is just um, what we have done is the manifold is open asymptotically, but we've closed it here and here. Those are the asymptotics. And um, okay, now, now let's understand what we have. So we have this square plus. Uh, there's our observer that's here. This is one of our coronal sets. The other set is with respect to the whole manifold. So we'll check the whole manifold um, here. And we look at the non 
at a path directed non space like curves. So we can draw a line here. So we can look at this, this set here, just draw this set. This set will be all on this. But there will be a boundary. And this is when we look at the path development, that here is. Here we have a line. This is a null curve. And this null curve is the boundary J plus, uh, J minus, sorry, of square plus. So here we have just J minus of square plus. That covers the whole part of that manifold, but not all the manifold. We have also a part which is not covered, and that is this interior part here. This is the interior of the black hole later. And the boundary of this set here, because it's asymptotically closed, it's closed here and it's closed here, but it's not closed here. So when we close it here, we will find the event horizon. This exactly is the black hole event horizon. And that is the definition of every event horizon, which is future. We can also have a past event horizon, then we have to, to, to swap. We have here, uh, square minus and here J plus. So it's the future development of square minus. Yeah. So in this sense, we now know what an event horizon is and we see that it's totally teleological. Why? Because it involves square plus as an observer. So this observer, which sits here, can only tell us when or where the event horizon is. And the event horizon, it can form between us. There can be an event horizon, it cannot form. There can be an event horizon between us, but we will never know because we have to wait until the whole future development has, has already passed. As we saw here, we have to look at the whole past development. Um, that means, but we sit here. That, that is to say, we have to solve when we are sitting at one point and when we want to understand whether there is an event horizon or not in our space time, we have to, to, to wait up the whole future development until we have reached square plus. And then we can say, well, there was an event horizon or there is an event horizon in between us, but we will never be able to detect it now because the definition tells us, well, we have to do it at square plus. And it's highly non-local because uh, we can, I cannot just say here, I want to understand uh, when I'm sitting here, where it is. We cannot do that. We can only see this when we have this specific observer sitting at that specific point. And that makes it highly non-physical because what we want to do is we want to go to a black hole and say, oh, I see a black hole horizon which has this size, or I see the Hubble horizon which has this size. That's something which is super important um, to, uh, to, in order to understand physics here. And this comes to another, brings us to another definition, and this is the definition of a black hole. Uh, so we can say a black hole is the region B minus, which is the manifold minus the closure of J squared plus M. Okay, so that is just the interior part here. That is the black hole. And as we see, the definition of a black hole is, uh, involves the presence of a horizon. So there are some people saying there are black holes which are, I don't know, whatever the objects, but they don't have a horizon. That's not a black hole. Black hole must have a horizon. If it is, if it does not have a horizon, it is not a black hole. It is something else which mimics the behavior of black holes. But the real black hole must come with a horizon. This just comes from the definition. Yeah. And um, what we can also see is that in this region here, all causal curves are trapped. Yeah. So we cannot communicate with any observer outside because all causal curves will have light cones like this. So they will hit the singularity here. This is singularity at r equals zero. And what we can also say is we can, we can from the space time, we can say the horizon is at r equal rs. That's clear because what happens there, the space time becomes dynamic. And um, 
this is a question we can ask. How do we see that? So let's ask a question. And this question is what happens at the event horizon? So when we consider the Schwarzschild metric uh, here, we will see that when we are for R smaller than Rs, this term and this term change their sign. So that is to say, um, so let's say for R smaller Rs, T becomes the space lag signature. and R becomes a time lag signature. So that means they exchange the roads. So is it like near horizon geometry or something like that? Um, uh, oh, sorry, so what do you mean? No, because there is an approach. I, I don't know much about that. People used to call it near horizon approach or something like that. Yeah, with the near horizon approach, you, you expand the metric at our edge. Around something. At our edge, usually, at the horizon. Uh, Rs, for example, here. yes. Um, such that you can uh, look at a smooth transition. Yes, yes. Exactly. But here for the Schwarzschild space, and we know we have no smooth transition because it is uh, singular at the horizon. So we have to change the coordinate system in order to, um, to see what, also, what, what happens there. Mm -hmm. Right, and um, but there is an easier way to do that, and that is um, to look at the killing vector. Yes. Um, therefore, I want to um, introduce this because the black hole event horizon is also a killing horizon, and um, at the killing vector is a good um, object to measure what happens at the horizon. Um, killing vector K is a vector field. Field um, which satisfies the following condition, which is the lead derivative um, along the field K of the metric should be zero and we can write it more versatile that in the coordinate KAB plus, this is just the derivative um, B A is equal to zero. Uh, that is the definition of a killing vector. And this killing vector, for example, um, what are the properties? Because uh, here we can see that it has interesting properties at the horizon. So K is time-like um, for R bigger than Rs. It is now for R equal Rs and K is space like for R small Rs. So here we see the killing vector is a good, um, a good tool to measure the horizon. And the killing vector usually um, is, yeah, it, it depends on the, on the, on the space time, but when you have a static space time, there is a theorem which tells you that um, the killing horizon and the the event horizon coincide. So it's it's just enough to check whether when this thing becomes a null vector, and then you're totally safe. You have you have found the horizon. Uh, this also works for some axisymmetric um, stationary space times. And uh, for example, in Schwarzschild, we can write down um, the killing vector. Schwarzschild. Uh, the killing vector is just proportional to dt. And this is usually the case when, um, actually it, it is dt. Um, this is usually the case when we have a static space time, then the killing vector is just going to the time direction. And therefore also the killing vector induces a preferred uh, foliation because it tells us we can foliate along the killing vector. And then we have a notion of time, which is preferred because it is due to a symmetry of space time. We have time translation invariance, and therefore um, we have invariance along the killing vector, along the killing flow, 
and that tells us, okay, we, have, we can define an invariant energy along this killing flow. Yeah, so when we look at the Schwarzschild patch, we can, the killing vector here is time-like, we have T, we have R, it is null at the horizon, and it is space-like here. Um, this space-like property allows us to, is actually an integral ingredient in the Hawking effect, because the Hawking effect involves this, a particle production, and one particle falls inside and it becomes a negative energy particle. That's what you might have heard sometimes. But um, usually it's weird to think about um, negative energy because in this region where the killing vector is time like you cannot define positive, uh, negative energy. But in this way, the space like is totally fine. Those particles can be there. And that, and that is exactly why when you have particle production, they have of course energy and it's positive in this region here. But once one has fallen inside, the energy is now measured with respect to the space-like killing vector field. And when it's measured with, this, with respect to the space-like killing vector field, it can change the sign and the energy becomes negative. That is the very cheap reason because the T, the T vector flips the sign and here it also, it becomes, you can think about this here, you see the sign flip because it's space-like and this allows you to say, well, that's a cheap reason to, to understand why here also the energy has, can have a flipped sign. Yeah, questions? Please ask questions if you have, if not, then proceed. Yeah, so I have one question. Yeah. Um, so you said if the killing vector is null, um, then you have an event horizon. You have a killing horizon. Yeah, so it's important, mm -hmm. I think, that the killing vector is null on a closed surface. Um. Um, um, I mean, because, because, I mean, already in Minkowski, you have, of course, killing vectors that are null, but they don't form a closed surface. Um, ah, I, I, and then, ah, now I know, I, I was, I was a bit confused. Yeah, for sure, they're, they're all killing vectors, dx, dy, dz. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, that's correct. Yeah, they, they form, uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. That's right, they form a closed surface, yeah. Mm -hmm. That is correct, yeah. Yeah, so you say if the killing vector, if there's a null killing vector forming a closed surface, then it coincides, this surface coincides with the event horizon. Yes. Okay. Yeah. yeah. yeah thank you for the clarification. Yeah, that's true. Thank you, Anes, for the clarification. And any more question? Any more comments or anything we say? If not, then Mark will proceed. Okay. Um, so what we have seen is, um, I just want to um, to say the event horizons have super nice mathematical properties. Although it, it might seem complicated, but they have nice properties because they are nice null uh, surfaces and all this. But we've seen they're teleological because they involve non-local and non-dynamical sets. <clears throat> and uh, we've seen that because you have to, to, to solve um, the whole Cauchy development. So we can write just down the problem is that um, event horizons, um, oops, event horizons are teleological. And non-dynamical. And um, one needs to know the whole Cauchy development, or the whole Cauchy development. Okay, 
And now the question is, how can we formulate them? A local and dynamical formulation of a horizon, which is detectable, because this is not detectable by local experiments. And this came first, um, Hawking and Ellis, I should mention them, they, they also found the remedy. So we have Hawking and Ellis. In their book, they define apparent horizons. But apparent horizons have also a problem because apparent horizons need to have the global restriction of being of, of, of being defined in asymptotically flat space time. But for Friedman, Lemaitre, Roberts, and Walker, this cannot be uh, the, the, the case. This is not the case. So not every Friedman, Lemaitre, Roberts, and Walker can be realized asymptotically flat. Therefore, one has to come up with something which is which does not involve those global. Um, assumptions, and this led to the definition of dynamic horizons. And there are basically two different formulations. I will explain one, while the other is already explained by Abai. There are lectures from Abai and the Living Review of Relativity, where he also explains this. Um, but I will focus on Hayward's description, because Hayward's description illuminates better the causal structure of space time. Okay, so we have a goal. And our goal is we want to have a local, dynamical, and um, also invariant description of horizons. Because we can for sure find local descriptions, but those local descriptions um, do not need to be coordinate variant because when I change the coordinate system, the horizon lies somewhere else, and that's not useful. So the problem is to find something local which is also coordinate independent, uh, not coordinate independent, which is uh, diffeomorphism invariant. And um, this led to the construction of dynamic or trapping horizon. And yeah, to uh, define uh, those. Yes. Tell me the, the, this is the goal, but what is the motivation? The motivation is that uh, the, the black hole event horizon is not physically observable. So we can never detect an event horizon. And also when we think about cosmological expansion, cosmological expansion can never be described by an event horizon. Mm -hmm. um, because of the restrictions which we cannot fulfill by an FL, FLLW space time. Mm -hmm. So in this sense, also when you have, for example, colliding black holes, and when yes, you want to right. understand how the, the mutual horizon forms, you need a dynamical description. Otherwise, with the event horizon, you can never describe this. True. So in, in this sense, this is a very physical, very important notion. So we'll start with my favorite thing, which is geometry. And um, we will geometrical preliminaries. I will cut them. I actually prepared more, but um, I think preliminaries, but I think it is not so useful um, to go into that detail. And I think we lose too many people. So therefore um, I will be a bit briefer in this case. So first we need to understand um, what is an embedding. An embedding is when we take a space-time and put it into another space-time. This can be realized by a map. And we always call it an embedding when the space-time we have um, put in or we have identified in another space-time is smaller or equal, then we can call it an embedding. So basically, we have a sub-manifold that is a manifold of lower dimension. Say we have a four-dimensional space-time and we want to put three-dimensional space-times just to, to slice it. Um, this is, for example, an embedding, but what is also an embedding is when we slice it and when we also consider the real line along which we slice, then we get a foliation where we find an embedding which covers the whole manifold by sub-manifolds and also uh, and has the same dimension, then we have found a foliation. And here, 
that is an important thing. We will look at a very specific foliation to define those horizons, but it will be in the end, the definition will be uh, foliation independent. Uh, so there are two constructions of um, dynamical horizons. And um, so that's important, the construction itself, dynamical horizons, um, involves a specific foliation, but specific foliation, because we need to understand how to construct and to find invariants out of this foliation. When we have an invariant in, a, in one foliation, it's invariant in another foliation because it's diffeomorphism invariant. That's the important thing. But we have to start with something, right? Uh, with specific variations, and uh, there are basically two different variations. That one is the one plus three foliation. Uh, this is basically you define, uh, you choose a time direction, and then you slice along this time direction into space like hypersurfaces, what which is sometimes the, also called the ADM formalism that will exactly, know. exactly, which is called ADM formalism, and this has been carried out by Ashtika and Krishnan. And there's a two plus two foliation which you have seen when uh, in Koska space time, for example. Is uh, which he is a the collaborator of Vaishak? Yes, I know. <laughs> oh, I wrote Krishnan. I, I should at least Krishnan. So. And <laughs> there's Hayward. He did it in the two plus two foliage. So as I said, since there's a nice lecture, which I cannot explain better than Abai, um, I will not focus on this. You can read this or you can watch the lecture there, but I will focus on this because I also think that two plus two um, is closer to understanding the causal structure we've seen as the other one. Because the two plus two, basically what we want is to choose two null congruences and then um, check how these null congruences behave throughout the evolution in space time. And that is what Hayward did. And I also appreciate Hayward a lot because I think he's the most underrated theoretical physicist uh, no, uh, which is living. Um, he has done so much important stuff. I cannot just, uh, that's a good credit. Okay, so we consider a smooth embedding. And this embedding is, uh, we call it Yota, which is, S. This is a two dimensional surface. And those are just intervals. Yeah, so my plus minus are just some half open intervals, which range from zero to some I plus or some I minus. And this we embed now in our four dimensional manifold to get the two plus two foliation. Yeah. Um, and how do we do that? This is geometrically very uh, complicated, but it's also super nice. And uh, I will take some time about this. So we define first evolution vectors. I will now present you um, a recipe. You can choose that as a recipe, what I will present now, to get every space time to the double null foliation. You don't need to think. Just put in what I show you, and you get the double null foliation for, space, for every space time you want. And that's the nice thing. You can formulate it super, um, super general. So we define evolution vectors, u plus, which are parameterized by some psi plus minus, which lies in these intervals. Uh, plus here will later can, can be thought of as outgoing and minus ingoing. But this only works when you think about a spherical symmetric space time, when it's something else 
it is not so clear that this you can call outgoing and ingoing. But I will refer to as out and ingoing because we can think about the whole time about a spherical symmetric space. And what we want to do now is those we want to construct everything such that those evolution vectors become the null congruences. Congruences are curves which um, with a family of curves and one through each point of the space time, which means those curves can principle cover the whole manifold. Um, and this is important. Um, but we want to have the null ones because the null one, this is not, not null a priori. The null ones are sensible for the causal structure of space time. Therefore, we choose them explicitly later. But now, first, we want to understand how we foliate into this double. We have a double, double foliation. Let's call it, for example, double, not double null. It's not important. Yeah. So how does it look like? We let's first go into the area. Let's first go into the three, one plus three because that's uh, um, that's more intuitive for most people, I guess so. So we can define a time t. And we have some spatial hypersurface sigma. And now the slicing of the ADM is just uh, uh, very easily. It's just uh, we slice along this and get our stack of hypersurfaces. That's how the ADM works. This is pretty, pretty straightforward. And uh, just, just to say, this thing here is an acronym set where you usually define these conditions and you let them evolve towards the time direction. But now we have a two-dimensional surface. Oops, oh, that's nice actually. Um, we have a two-dimensional surface. So we have the two plus two. And now it becomes a bit more complicated. We have two evolution vectors. Let's call them u plus and u minus. They do not need to be the light cone. It does not need to have anything to do with it a priori. Now we can define hypersurfaces, which are such that, um, uh, which are such that, uh, what the fuck is going on here? Okay, um, sorry. Yeah, so let me, let me write it like this. Okay. okay, so we can define hypersurfaces, three-dimensional hypersurfaces, sigma plus minus, they are also three-dimensional, but how are they constructed? They're constructed such that you take S cross um, this I plus or S cross this I minus, just one. So they are lying, they're, they're two-dimensional S and then you, they evolve along, the, the third dimension is along these evolution vectors, which are parameterized by this, uh, um, but it's xi. So these xi here induce a three-dimensional hypersurface, which does not lie like this, but it lies like that. And at the intersection, the intersection of those hypersurfaces, at each, each intersection, we can again see what our S is doing, because at any intersection lies a point of S. So we can play this game and we see that when we do that, we get the same picture as the left side. We just get how our surfaces evolve, but now we see that how this S evolves. So this is quite nice. We look always at the intersection and th those intersections then tell us how this S evolves in space time. That is how to define a foliation with this two plus two in very general, yeah. So these u, I should say that, um, those u plus minus are tangent to sigma minus plus, yeah. Um, and those, those surfaces here are the constant u plus or the constant u minus surface. So the constant u minus surface is sigma minus and the constant uh, u plus surface is the sigma plus. Okay. 
But now comes the catch. The catch is that this is only, um, th this determines the, uh, the, the foliations only up to different morphisms. And um, so we can rename this by some other theta. And this is determined up to. And this will be important because later when we need to understand um, how to construct diffeomorphism in variant quantities, we need to keep this in mind because we will have to understand which objects are uh, um, invariant by the diffeomorphisms because otherwise we have a notion which we can change to, to whatever we want. Questions so far? Okay. Okay, so we can think about the evolution vectors, Q plus minus, as the derivative. Yeah, just, just as uh, normal GR, it's the, the change in the in the um, parameter, and we can construct one forms out of this, and those are the normal one forms. N plus minus, and they're just the minus sign here appears because um, when we want to be this to be future directed, we need to put a minus sign here in order to have another, the one form also future directed. And the opposite goes for past directed. So this sign actually only ensures that their orientation is the same. Okay. So I, I just put it sign for uh, um, time orient orientation. So you, you're all familiar with vectors, covectors, or one forms? Yes, no? I think yes. Okay, good. So then I don't need to say anything. Okay, so now we can construct the dual vector. We call this vector L plus minus. And this is just, I will use the coordinate invariant uh, the, the, the index free notation. This is just GAB, I'll write it once, N plus A, L plus minus B. Uh, no, that's wrong. Uh, equals, yeah. So that, that is the coordinate free, just to, to see once how this is uh, carried out. Um, so we construct those dual vectors, these L's, yeah, just by this. So there's nothing has happened. Um, just an information. The one forms are closed. That means when applied uh, an exterior derivative, this gives zero. This is important when you want to carry out some calculations. And um, yes. And we have seen that u plus are tangent to square minus plus. And this means n plus minus u minus plus is equal to zero. That's the same condition. And we impose the normalization. n plus minus L plus minus is minus one, it's minus one. That's just how we normalize those things. But let's, we have an observation here. And the observation is that those sigma square plus are not yet null. Yeah, they're, they're just arbitrary. But we have now to, con to construct it such that they become null because then those else will become um, the null congruences and we can probe the light construct, uh, the, the causal structure here. 
So how do we do that? Then we have to do another exfoliation. So now take sigma plus minus to be null. Uh, that means that GL plus minus equals zero and G plus minus um, G minus one. Oh, no, G, G is correct. That G L plus minus L minus plus is equal to some normalization. Okay. So this is the condition, this is the, the, what it implies, and we can construct the induced metric on the induced metric on S. And this we call H, and this is the full metric plus 2N and plus cross n minus. But here I said um, the full metric, but um, we have to, to be aware this thing is just the relevant coordinates. Where, for example, when it's the uh, x and y coordinate, then g, we have to take gxy, gxx, um, and not the, the other co co coordinates with respect to s. Okay. And so now what we need to do is we have these evolution vectors which are at some angle, but we want them to be now perpendicular to our null surfaces. But what we need to understand is how far are they away from being null vectors. And this we can understand when we project these, uh, yeah, when we project that part onto our surface and see whether there is um, some shift or not. And we can therefore introduce the shift vector on plus minus. And this you can think of, I will write the coordinate because that is important. Um, you see, is equal to Ra, because this thing now tells us when this thing is zero, then our evolution vectors are already null and we don't need to do anything. If they're not null, we need to subtract this shift vector such that they become null. Yeah? So we want to relate our evolution vectors to the null congruences. And this can be done in the following sense with the null congruences, L plus minus, and this is the normalization M, U plus minus minus R plus minus. So that now tells us well, we have some space time and we want to foliate in some weird way, but we don't care. And we want to bring it in the double null foliation. We have to define all the quantities I told you about and then to do this difference, and we we get automatically the null uh, curves, and now we can write the metric in the general form. So now we have the most general general metric um, compatible with the double null foliation. You want to do a null. Okay, so this is kind of exciting because um, it is super cool. I'll write it in the coordinate. No, in the I'll write it once for you as uh, with indices. Let me let me let me be nice one time to stay. Okay, it's so much to write. It's kind of horrible. And then I will explain why you have seen all actually this form of the metric, because everyone has seen that. Ah, I should say the basis is now uh, U plus, U minus, E1, E2, and those are the basis for S, the space-like um, surface. 
is A, H A two, R A. Yes. Um, then we have this table here. It's a good thing that it's symmetric because I don't have to write that much. Um, Here H11, H22, H12, H21. Okay, that's the most general form. And as I said, when you have chosen U and um, those U's to be null already, then R is equal zero. Think about the Minkowski space time in, in line co coordinates. This is zero. And this is zero because you get only the UV coordinates. And the UV coordinates, this is also zero, this is also zero, zero, but the UV part is just the normalization. Yeah, as you see, when you think about the Minkowski in dual null, it looks like minus the UDV plus the spatial part. And um, the spatial part is just uh, the, the X square y square. Uh -huh. um, and everything which involves an R is zero. So this part is zero, this part is zero, and we see the only component is the UV, and those are those two, and they only come because there is this factor. So you see, this is a very general form. You can put every space time into that form, and you have the double null formulation. I think it's super nice but you can be more versatile in the sense of that you just choose the following things. You say, oh, well, to do this, I just impose those, those two conditions, those three conditions. Oh, that is zero. Three conditions. And then I just solve for my else, and then I have the, the then all my hours are zero. So this can be done also in a more easy way. Okay, why have we done that? All this stuff? Um, we want to understand the dual null foliation, but now comes the important quantity we can get. Question so far. Okay, so we can define the null expansions of S along L plus and minus. And those are called theta plus, this is minus one half induced metric, D derivative along L plus and minus. H, and this is just given by it. Yeah. And then we have the D derivative plus minus of H A B. Okay. And those things are called expansions. And those expansions can, can be defined at each point. So these things are a local notion. And this is now the key to define dynamical horizons. Let's visualize this object. Yeah. Um, so this is the key to dynamic horizons. Visualizing, we can say we take some area. We define. We take one. Uh, can I ask? Yeah. Uh, when you have the curly. L plus minus, is it the lead derivative with respect to the U plus minus? No, uh, L. 
So uh, this is actually. Oh, ah, okay. So I, I should say L plus minus is just abbreviation of L of L plus minus. Okay, thank you. Okay, so we have, uh, we take one, let's say L plus, for example. So we have to drag this area along this vector field. So what happens? We can, of course, put this at each point of this A, this type of null congruence, and see what happens. And what we see is that here, the vector just drags the surface such that it becomes bigger. Or it just changes. Yeah, it doesn't need to be bigger. It is something. For example, when we take L minus, it would it would shrink, for example. So that means here we get the delta A induced to this dragging along the null, uh, the null congruence. And this is a first hint why this is a good notion. This induces dynamics. Well, we could, because when we look at the slicing, we can define some areas, for example, like the horizon, at each slice and look how it is dragged along those null rays. And as we have seen how this foliation works, we can now induce an evolution. But still, this thing is not coordinate invariant, and this isn't useless in that sense. Um, but it's the first hint that this is a nice um, property, that this is a nice quantity. So uh, theta plus minus um, induces a change of area along so minus. And as we can see also, as a second hint, that this has something to do with curvature, is that we can identify here the this part as theta plus, uh, not theta, as I call it alpha plus minus, which is the extrinsic curvature. So this thing knows about its embedding. It knows about how this, how how there are some curvature also in the in the bigger part in, in the bigger manifold, and therefore this is a very uh, sensitive quantity to um, causal structure, as we will see uh, later on. But uh, first, we need to understand how we can construct out of this thing the horizon, and also invariant quantities. Let's start first with invariant quantities, and we define uh, the weight. So we have a quantity x, and this x, um, oops, this x transforms on the x, and we have a transformation, order transformation, such that x goes like. Now comes the theta again, and here we have some power. Um, this is not the mean derivative. Some theta b x. So this is when you have a tensor. You know there are all those things um, coming in front of, depending on the rank of the tensor. Yeah. So then x is set of rank set to b of rank of weight. Sorry. Um, Wait, and now we can define this as um, plus corresponding to the first and minus corresponding to the second quarter transformation. And it is easy that when x stays x, we can figure out invariance have weight one. Yeah, that's easy because we here we have. We have to the power of zero, here we have to the power of zero. All those terms disappear and it has a weight one. And we can construct invariants uh, immediately. We can find that. Um, I won't show that. And we can define two invariants, which is n theta plus theta minus and n L plus minus theta minus plus. And those two will be used to define our trapping horizons. 
that's now now we come to the, to the real part, the real stuff. So we are at B the trapping horizons. So everyone who has slept can now come again. Okay. So now we know that we have to involve those things in order to get an invariant definition of horizons. And first we want to define something useful, which is called the normal region. Um, normal region. Okay, so the normal region is a region of space-time. Space time where now we use the invariant quantity and we choose n to be one where this holds everywhere on S. Oh, that, that what's that? Everywhere on S. Okay, why is that? Why is that defining a normal region? I call it normal because we can move freely and we can move um, like in the costly space. That should be normal. So how do we do? We see that. Okay, we have some A. Now we can define two null congruences, L plus, and uh, yeah, let's choose L minus. And along L minus, we see. Okay. In Minkowski, along our minds when we're ingoing, it shrinks. When we are outgoing, it should expand. Yeah. Okay. So the area along one light cone goes is bigger, and the other one is smaller. That is exactly what is written here. One expansion is positive, and one expansion is negative. Therefore, the invariant is smaller than zero. That's just. Um, what, what it says. Yeah, so um, therefore, oops. Therefore, in normal regions, um, in that sense, outgoing is outgoing, and ingoing is ingoing. Because once one in one direction, the, uh, the expansion becomes negative and we want in the other direction, it becomes positive. So this is the standard way of defining a light cone. And now we can define the opposite region. This is a trapped region. Trapped region is a compact spatial. Doesn't need to be compact actually, but uh, so this definition goes uh, to pen rows, two surface S, where theta plus minus, theta plus theta minus is bigger than zero everywhere on S. Okay. So why is that? Let's, let's have a look. Um, so what does it mean to be trapped? Okay, let's draw a nice diagram. We start with some A, and now we have, again, two congruences. So in order to be this quantity to be bigger than, they have to point in the same direction. So one inward, that's okay, that's still our L minus. But now the other one has also to point inward because otherwise the expansion would be negative again. Like uh, this invariant would be negative again. So in this sense, in both directions, our, um, our area shrinks. But therefore the, the, the multiplication is positive. And this is called future trapped. Um, is called future trapped, trapped region. And we can also have for sure past trapped region. This means that 
it is trapped in the past, but that tells us that both have to be in the past development, have to shrink, but in the future development, they both expand. So now our L minus expands and our L plus also expands the surface. So they're both expanded. This is a past trapped region. Um, and as you, as you now might understand, so, so let's say future trapped. So Mark. Yes. The future trapped picture up, upward thing, both the things are L minus? Oh, 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 sorry. Yes, this is L plus. Yeah, because also the outgoing is ingoing. So outgoing, effectively ingoing, and ingoing stays ingoing. Yeah, thank you. So this, for example, describes the interior of a black hole. Yeah, everything gets compressed into the singularity, like in a, a, a gravitational collapse. And that is a future trap region because we cannot escape the black hole. Because once we are in the inside the trap, uh, inside the trapped region, we cannot go out. There is no option that we can really go out of the black hole. Because even when we try to go out with the speed of light, we will follow this null congruence. But this null congruence also leads us inward. And therefore, we are trapped in the in the future development. So for the past trapped, the theta plus bigger and theta minus also big. So we cannot stay like in the white hole. When you place someone in the white hole, it will be expelled because all, even if you try to stay inside, it's impossible because the gravitational, uh, yeah, let's say force, we should not say, but um, the direction uh, which is which is forced by the uh, by 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 the geometry will lead us outward. Even when we try to be with the speed of light going inward, we can never because uh, the speed of light going inward will follow this curve and will still get expelled. And now it's clear how we can define the horizon, and this is exactly at the boundary of those two regions, as we have seen in the event horizon case. So we can define um, the trapping horizon. Uh, no, we can first define the marginal trapped surface. Because that is exactly at the boundary of both. Surface. So marginal trapped surface is a two surface. with either theta plus equals zero. It's called future trapped, future marginal trapped, or theta minus equals zero, which is the past marginal trapped. Um, while the other is um, non-zero, yeah, so why the opposite, the opposite is non-zero, it's unequal zero, yeah, everywhere on S, that is the definition. So to visualize this, that is not a, a big deal. Um, we have a thing, we have the congruence, the ingoing congruence, L minus, and we have the outgoing congruence L plus. But now L plus is just like a cylinder. So in this direction, it does not change. So it's, we cannot go out, but we can also stay there. So we are marginally trapped. While the ingoing direction still is ingoing, the outgoing direction traps us in the, in that sense, uh, smallest possible way. Uh, 
and that will define the horizon now. Um, yeah, exactly. So that is marginally future trapped. And for past, we can, of course, um, also fall for this is future. Future marginally trapped and the past is, of course, accordingly that um, now the outgoing is like that. And the, uh, the ingoing is like that and the outgoing is still outgoing. Yeah. And this part here will then be the past horizon. So when, when, we, when something happens here and this, when something happens here, that will be the future horizon. So this is, this is just past, past marginal trap. Okay. And how to, to define a horizon now? Now we can adapt the double null foliation to the marginal trap surfaces to define the horizon. And um, the horizon is the following. Um, yeah, so we have a trapping horizon. Trapping horizon. Is uh, the closure of a three dimensional surface. This is uh, three dimensional. which is foliated by marginally trapped surfaces with the condition theta plus equals zero and theta minus smaller zero or theta minus equals zero and theta plus bigger zero. That is the definition of a trapping horizon because we have a three surface, but this surface consists of marginally trapped surfaces. How can we, how can we think about that? Um, so we can draw again pictures. We have, uh, let, let's take the ADM because it's easier to, to understand. Um, but it's, it, we have seen it's the same. Let's just choose the so we have some some hyper some hypersurfaces, and we can define on this hypersurface some horizon. So this is yeah. So we can also have here something, and here a group something. Um, yes. So we can define it like that, and here it's like this. Okay, and what we can see is this forms a tube. Uh, and this tube now is our dynamic horizon because this is a three dimensional surface, that, that, that's, that's clear, but it also knows the dynamics because this theta has uh, dependence on every point. And that tells us, okay, this can in principle vary this, this tube here, that is, that is our age. This can vary, it can shrink, it can expand, it can have different forms, it can change. But that is, this is mapped by this imaginary trapped surface, which are defined on each hypersurface. We say, well, on this hypersurface, the imaginary trapped surface looks like that. On the next, it looks like that. And on the next, it looks like that. And now we look how this condition evolves in time or evolves in some development, it does not matter, but usually one in time. And this gives us the dynamics, yeah? So this red part changes its form, this marginal trapped surface. And this is actually covered by the, um, by this quantity, by this invariant, theta plus theta minus equals, uh, equals zero, for example, because that is in principle depends on, on the time. So we can look at, localize the horizon at each and every point on the manifold or at each and every instant of time to see how it looks, where it is, and uh, because of the condition of the marginal trapped surface. Okay. That is how to define a dynamic horizon. 
I will make an example later that you can see how we actually carry that out. Are there questions so far? Um, can I ask a question? Yes. So can you go back to the picture? Can you speak a little bit louder? Yes. So uh, can you, can you, is it possible to do a similar um, picture for the case where you have the two, two plus two foliation? Because I, I really have difficulties to see ah, we have how the, the yeah. When you have the two plus two foliation, you would consider those, um, I had tried to, to, so then you have those, those things, right? As we have seen. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the, here is the direction of the null congruence. For example, L plus. It's also L plus. And then you can also define the L minus L Q. Okay, here I should probably, um, let, let's take it. Uh, and um, so what, what you will see is, so now you can also try to, to um, I think, okay, so this is tangent, yes. Um, so in principle, you have then some foliation which goes along these L of these things. And as we sa say, said, the meeting point of those those foliations gives you the, where the S lies. Okay. And so you say, well, I have this meeting point here. I have this meeting point here. I have a meeting point here of those two because, because they, they lie wherever they are. And now yes. you can check how they lie and they, they intersect in a specific S. But now you need to find the intersection at which this is a marginal trapped surface. So you choose one of those sigma plus minus to be along the margin of the trap, and then you check where the other s's hit. Okay, yeah? so that's that's why you still have a three-dimensional yeah. surface. Okay, exactly. thank you. Okay, so now we can classify our horizons because there's another, we have another invariant, so we can just look what this invariant tells us, right? Um, um, so we, we have another invariant, which is, which is L plus minus theta minus plus. So we try to understand what does it mean? And this is actually super important because we will find that this will def uh, classify us, uh, our horizons. So we can define two other horizons. So one is called inner if L minus plus of plus minus is bigger than zero at the marginal trapped surface. And we can define someone which is outer Tell no, what, what, what did I write here? I know that that's right. Um, plus is small zero at the modular track. So, so, what does it mean? So, what, what do we do? Check when we go with our we take a lead derivative, and this here this is the lead to the derivative along the well defined. Um, uh, direction. So for example, when we have a future trajectory, horizon, we look at the ingoing. And now we check how this expansion changes, how the expansion, which changes sign um, along the, so we check in, yeah, okay, so let, let me say like this. We have a, um, let me draw a picture. So we have a horizon here, let's say, margin trap surface. And what we understand, we have here some, uh, some L which is the ingoing, for example, for the future trap. And then we have two expansions. We look at the expansion theta plus here is a positive and here the theta plus is negative. So we want to understand is in which direction along L minus 
um, we get trapped. So it can also be that, for example, we are trapped. Um, we are trapped here uh, on the on the right hand side, and we are not untrapped on the left hand side. This can also be. So in that sense, it tells us where the normal region lies and where the um, trapped region lies. So this is just um, to tell in which direction, which crossing I'm trapped or I'm not trapped. So, um, but when we think about spherical symmetry, spherical symmetry, that's the easiest way, spherically symmetric case. Um, we have, yeah, we can, we can derive the horizon. So this is the horizon called RH. And now the question is, well, we have another complex. Let's just be very blunt. So we, yeah, so from, we go here. So either we are trapped inside or we're trapped outside, right? It can be either this is a trapped region of the circuit symmetric space time, or the red part is the trapped region. And there's where this, this uh, name comes from. Inner horizons have the normal region inside and the trapped region is outside, and outer have the normal region outside. So this outer and inner refers to the normal region, to the good region, where we can uh, have a, a good observer and where we are not non-trapped. So in this sense, uh, we can now classify with four type, well, five types of horizons. So we have four trapping horizons. Um, so we have a future outer trapping horizon, which is defined by the following. So we have theta plus equals zero marginally trapped in the future and uh, this is smaller at s um, oh, let's say we have future trapping horizons uh, this, these are the those are defined by that and we have an outer one which is given by l minus theta plus smaller zero at the marginal trapped surface and this is clear so when we are in going we get trapped. So the expansion becomes negative, it changes sign in this direction. And um, this is, for example, this happens for the black hole. So a black hole horizon in a dynamical description is called a future outer trapping horizon. That is the equivalent of a black hole, event horizon, not event horizon, but of a black hole horizon. And we have inner, this is L minus theta plus, bigger than zero at the MTS. And that, for example, is a cosmologic horizon because now the normal region is inside this ball and outside is a trapped region, but it's future trapped, so it's all put together. And that, for example, happens at the big crunch scenario. So outside, the things come faster than the speed of light um, into the normal region because everything contracts, contracts the universe. And we can have a past trapping horizon which is defined by that, the marginal past trapped. And this is bigger than zero at S. And again, we can have an outer, which is L plus theta minus smaller than zero at the MTS. This is given, for example, a white hole, because a white hole expels everything. So we're past trapped, but we're future anti-trapped, anti also sometimes called anti-trapped because everything gets expelled into the normal region. Yeah, and we have inner, this is L plus, L minus is bigger than zero. That, for example, we know is a Big Bang scenario, the Hubble sphere, which we see is, for example, a future, uh, past inner trapping horizon. Because we're sitting in the normal region, we observe there is a, um, a line of sight where we cannot uh, look beyond because everything which is beyond is, is, is trapped and it's, it gets expelled faster than the speed of light because of the expansion of the universe. And um, that, for example, characterizes the Hubble sphere. Big bang. 
that. And there's a fifth thing, which is called degenerate. Degenerate is uh, very easy. It's just when L plus minus of L minus plus is identical to zero at the MTS, then the horizons inner and outer at the same time. Sometimes it's also, this for example happens for extreme or black holes, or um, it also happens um, at the radiation field universe. And usually it's referred to as a horizon with weak pole structure. This is important when you look at the thermodynamics of horizon. Then the pole structure becomes, becomes important. Okay. So this now is definition of classification of trapping horizons. With this, we can describe every horizon. And now let's look at the black hole formation just to understand what happens here. So we have here some, so the diagram we have read already, here's a singularity. And what now we have a, a bunch of matter. So this, this is a star which collapses, no matter. Yeah. And we can, we have found out how to construct the event horizon. That's the black hole event horizon. Event horizon. But what, how, how can we think of this dynamic horizon now in the formation process? Yeah, that, that's kind of, that's good. So the star collapses, it becomes denser and denser. And at some point, the horizon falls. And this really falls. We, we, we arrive at a point where the marginal trapped surface um, falls. And that is called the bifurcation point. At that point, we have, that is degenerate because we have in and out at the same time at the same point. But now something interesting happens. There's one inner horizon, which now is going inside and approaches in, in some sense r equals zero. When it approaches r equals zero, then the singularity forms. So this region here is still a normal region. When you think about the Reiser Nordstrom black hole, it has, it has this inner horizon, but here also. This is a normal region because here nothing has happened. This is also part of this, so this is all normal region at the moment. And then we, it forms an outer horizon. And the outer horizon, now I should not take this color. The outer horizon now approaches the event horizon. This is the outer, that's the inner. So we have a bifurcation point with two horizons kind of expand, one shrinks and the other expands. And what we see here asymptotically, the outer horizon will, if it is, if there is no matter influx or something like that, will asymptotically approach the black hole event horizon at infinite past, uh, future, while the inner horizon will just disappear. So as we see here, this part here is still containing of the normal region, but those horizons have interesting properties because they are not none, as you can see. This horizon is different. So when, when the horizon area shrinks, um, the horizon, oh no, no, I have to think, I have to, I've written that uh, down because otherwise it always, it always confuses me. Yeah, those dynamic horizons can become time-like, space-like, and uh, so let's say trapping horizons can be time-like, as we see, space-like, or null in the isolated, um, in the isolated case. So that means no matter crosses, it stabilizes uh, at infinity. So it approaches the event horizon, but it will never be the event horizon. So it's still physical notion. So when we have an old black hole, which has formed for, since a long time, it will probably be very close to the uh, black hole event horizon and by measurement, we won't see, but still, what we see is a trapping horizon and not a black hole event horizon. Uh, and, and you can you think of when I have another surface, and this now surface expands. Yeah, when it expands, then it should be then it's space like because it's faster than speed of light. And when it's uh, when it's shrinking, then it becomes time like, like in the evaporation process. And um, there are different formulations of this trapping horizon, but they mostly coincide in most of the cases. There are some subtleties, which are, there's a great book on uh, horizons where you can all can read all these subtleties. Okay, questions so far for this part of the trapping horizon.
Um, I have a, uh, I, I need a small clarification. Um, can you hear me? Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, uh, could you please go to the previous diagram where you show the um, dynamical horizon tube? Uh, not this, yeah. Yeah, this one, sorry, the tube. Um, sigma with the, mm -hmm. the trap itself, yeah. So, uh, um, could you, uh, so, so the red, the red sub manifold that you have drawn, um, so uh, can I assume it's space like here, the dynamical horizon? Um, so this thing here is, uh, no, the, the, I mean, as, as I've drawn it, as I've drawn it here, it looks very time back, right? No, I mean, you, you yeah. don't know. At the moment, you don't know. It depends on whether it shrinks or whether it expands. Right. Okay. So, okay, um, so uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, please go on. So, let's just consider for, for a moment, this here is the horizon, that it just expands like that. Okay. No, that, that's confusing. So, let's say we have a horizon, we have a tube which goes like this. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, that that would correspond to matter falling in the black hole, right? Right. Yeah. So yeah. Um, when we look at the Penrose diagram, um, yeah. Let, no, let's draw another. Um, let, let's look at exactly that part. Okay. So here we have the part where the event horizon is, and here we have this part. Um, so let's forget about the event horizon. So we have the bifurcation point, the inner horizon. And we don't care about the inner horizon. So now we have this, which approaches this event horizon, but now we let matter falling in. Yeah, that means here where the matter falls in, it becomes space-like, and then yeah. it goes and continues to right. approach another curve. Right. But when you now also take Hawking radiation into account. Here it starts, let's say here it starts to, to, to Hawking radiate at that point. It will become more time-like, time-like, and there you can also form closed trapped surface without a singularity. Yes, yeah, so we have a bifurcation point in and out of horizon. Then you have some processes which let this, uh, for example, in the Hawking evaporation, which turns this horizon time-like such that it closes again. Right, right, okay. So it, it really depends on the specific system, what you look at, whether it's time or space. Like usually you can think of uh, if, um, and we, we can say that, um, so here time lag is area shrinks. Right, right. Here area expands. And area stabilizes. Yeah, I, I got actually confused with the direction of the null normals that you drew to S in that picture. Um, for a space-like case, both of them should be pointing in this inwards, I, I suppose, um, because uh, the normal to S each uh, uh, two-dimensional spatial leaf S should be a space-like vector, which is tangent to the uh, three-dimensional dynamical horizon if it's space-like. Uh, yeah, so that that was a technicality I missed. Yeah, thanks. Okay. Okay. Um, so what one can do is one can define something like a killing equivalent. So um, we can also define uh, the equivalent to killing horizon. Um, yeah, sorry, there, there was another point. Uh, I probably am bringing up late. So this was with uh, in connection with the relation between the event and the killing horizons that was that came up in the beginning. Yeah. Um, so I think um, uh, pro pro some part of that could be confusing in the sense that um, um, if uh, a dynamical horizon or um, let's say we have an isolated horizon. That, that is not closed. Its topology is um, S cross, uh, S2 cross R, sphere cross R. Um, so the statement that was made was, um, if we have a closed um, surface on which a killing vector uh, has zero norm, then, then it coincides with, with, with this event horizon. So I think that can lead to some confusion. Um, mm -hmm. 
yeah so yeah maybe it would be good if you could clarify on that um yeah, yeah what uh, what is exactly the confusion because uh... okay so so basically um the event horizon of a black hole and the killing horizon coincide um, uh, mostly when the space time is static or stationary uh, static so stationary was, yeah uh, basically when the horizon is isolated let's say um, and furthermore mm -hmm. uh, i think uh, in that situation uh, although a killing horizon is probably an event horizon uh, the reverse is probably not true always yeah uh... The, the reverse is for sure not true. That 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 to that I agree. Um, um, and also the fact that um, the point as to that the killing vector norm vanishes on a closed surface. The horizon is actually not a closed submanifold. It's uh, the its its foliations are closed as spherical, but right. the full dynamical horizon is not closed or the full. Yeah, yeah. Horizon the, the, is not this was this was yeah, yeah, yeah. That is right. This was just for for static horizon. This has nothing to do with the dynamic horizon as a prior. The statement which was made there by the for the killing vector was just for the static case and for those sets we have defined. There was nothing about weakly isolated or something like that. No, that that I agree. Um, in, in the dynamic case, it's much. It's in that sense that there's a subtlety because. Um, you look at different you look at different sets which are not yeah, but because usually you look at closed sets right when you define event horizon right. or static horizons right. um, but I, I don't know whether i wouldn't consider the isolated horizon as a static horizon right right yeah so so in that sense you need to go with the definition we put above we you need to go with that set and you cannot um so I understand there is a there's a subtlety by looking and therefore I put so much effort in saying oh, this is closed this is open, uh, in order to 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 make sure that there is no confusion. Right, right, yeah. So um, in this sense, I agree with you. Um, to define it, you need to put a lot of care, ex especially when you look at um, complicated space time where you, where there's an, where you don't have an intuition. Or when you look at space times, for example, let, yeah, let's consider um, a space time which is um, with a PP wave. Those space times are not globally hyperbolic. So when you consider the ADM formulas, you're basically screwed because you cannot find the formulae there because there is no orientable space like hypersurface, right? Because the orientation flips uh, when you cross the PP wave. Yeah. Um, so in this sense, uh, there is okay there's not but but when you have su such space like like this you cannot define a horizon you need in that sense this double null foliation and to look at the specific set and you can never define a killing can you define a killing a killing horizon there i think you can't right yeah i i'm not sure about that yeah so because that was another point a killing horizon assumes that there is a symmetry which need not always be true yeah, exactly. Because there you don't have global hyperbolicity. And I think that is already a problem when you want to define a, a killing horizon. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Probably this point was brought up uh, much before you discussed the closed uh, and and the open sets probably. Uh, yeah. So that's why I just thought that uh, they should be clarified after you discuss these. Yeah, that, that, that's super important. I agree. This is super important to be uh, very precise here. Yes. Thank you. Sure, you're welcome. Okay, so we, we can define an equivalent to the Kian vector for any dynamic horizon, which you can call the dual null uh, vector, a dual expansion vector, sorry. So actually, I should not uh, write for the red green blind people. So, um, yes. so the dual null expansion vector is uh, the unique vector field, vector field defined as a following. 
So it is the archduke of some age. And this is just given by that object. This object, you can find that in the, so this vector without the Hodge dual is called, um, this is a curvature vector, which tells you how the curvature is actually. And this thing has nice properties. This thing, um, has exactly the same properties uh, as the killing vector. So this is uh, time-like in the normal region. It is null at the marginal trapped surface. And it is uh, space-like in the trapped region. So this is super important. This is general. There's no symmetry assumed here. And this thing, for example, generalizes, no, not generalizes, specializes. When we go for static, uh, in static space terms, so in static case, uh, this becomes just the killing vector. And when we go into spherical symmetry, symmetric case, this becomes, um, the Kodama vector, which is um, the equivalent of the killing vector. And this is solving that equation. So here it induces also symmetry, but a weaker symmetry than the killing vector. The killing equation is, um, so this is both K, but one is Kodama, one is killing. Um, so this is a symmetry on the whole space time. And this is, when you have a spherical symmetric space time, sorry, then you have spheres of symmetry, which are the shells of a sphere. And this Kodama vector now, um, it uses a flow, an invariant flow, which is, um, which reflects the spherical symmetry here. And this has also the same properties. It's time-like in the normal region. It is space-like in the uh, trapped region and it's marginally trapped at the, at the horizon. For example, the dynamic of black hole. So in this sense, this dual null expansion vector has the same properties and we can define invariant quantities like the surface gravity and the um, energy along the flow associated by this. And this vector also um, uh, gives you the Hamiltonian flow. So this thing, this construction is super powerful if you also want to do quantum physics in this uh, set. But that has not, so, so this thing is for each and every, um, Symmetry. Okay, so now we can look at uh, what does what does this mean? So this induces an observer which sits at a specific distance on a fixed point away from the horizon in the normal region. That is the definition of the observer which is induced by that vector. So you take some space time, some weird. Uh, horizon, and I place myself at some specific point, let's say five meters away from the horizon, and this, then I will become exactly the observer associated to the dual null expansion vector, and the Kodama is um, some observer which sits at a fixed radius away from the horizon in a spherical symmetric space. -time. And this is an accelerated observer because I have to uh, be accelerated not to fall, for example, the black hole. And um, towards this observer, you can define uh, thermal, you can do thermodynamics locally and also derive the Hawking effect as a local quantity, as a local effect. And that's super nice. Okay. So now let me, let me make a nice example. I think it's a nice example. And then we are done. So we consider the most general um, Spherical symmetric space time. Ah, I should say, yeah, since I, before, I, before I do that. So what we have done is we have characterized the, the horizon with respect to invariance. We have used the double null foliation, but the statement where the horizon is at half and 
all those things, all this information we have extracted from the horizon are coordinated and varied because we have constructed like this. So we can use whatever space time in whatever foliation you want, and you can calculate the same, um, all those theta plus theta minus. Actually, I will do that now. I will not use it, I will not transform into the dual and foliation, but I will just choose some foliation, which I like, which I just got, calculate theta plus theta minus the null congruences, and it's invariant. And I could also have done it in the opposite way, just first transform the metric in dual and null and then choose it, but that's not needed because we have chosen invariant quantities. And that's the important thing here because we have, we have local invariants and that's um, how you have to define. Otherwise there's, it's meaningless in general relativity. Okay, space time. Uh, this can be written like this. You have to believe me uh, that this is true. So this is uh, depending on T and R because it's very symmetric, so it does not depend on the on the uh, angles. Yeah. The dt square plus dr square over. That's actually a very interesting thing. Um, this describes Schwarzschild, Reisler Nordström, and uh, all those nice. Uh, space times and it's kind of nice to see what uh, you have to put for m and for h also describes by dia and those things so we can transform we can perform coordinate transformation um which i wrote in the notes um it's not important how this looks um to get parley strand Coordinates. Uh, and this is given by then the following. This is also still the most general. So there is nothing, nothing has happened at the moment. I will suppress. So psi is now psi of uh, T and R, and also M is now M of T and R, but I won't write it. Yeah, so that's uh, that's assumed. So we have um, yeah, one minus two m r. And then we have the sum Jacobi from the coordinate transformation, and we call now the new time tau. That's a positive good sum time. Then we have two two minus psi over d tau over dt, square root of 2m over r, d tau dr, then there is some dr square, and some r square, d2 omega. Okay, this is now the most general metric in polynomials on coordinates, and we do another um, renaming. We call this thing here a of t and r, and this we call b of t and r. Yeah, so the two is not in the b. And we can calculate the null congruence. You have 20 minutes left. Yeah, 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 I, I have, I have uh, I've actually two minutes, two, two, five minutes left. Okay. I'm almost done. I just wanted to make an example. So we can have the null congruence L plus. It's one over A, one A minus B, zero, zero. That is the outgoing direction. And here outgoing is really outgoing because it is a uh, symmetric. And we have the ingoing. I just wanted to, to show how to really see this dynamic horizon once that this is not, um, this is no magic, yeah? And we have normalized this L plus L minus, such that this is minus two. So we have defined this big N as two. Now we can calculate the congruences. This HAB, that's induced metric, and L plus minus B, and we find the following. 
ratio of the R, R the square root of 2m over R. And we have the other congruence, which is minus 2 over R, the square root of 2m over R. Okay, okay so those are the, uh, the expansions. And now what can we say? We can, we can look at where our trapped region, where's the normal region. So normal region, we know that plus minus must be smaller than zero. And this happens, as you can see, if R is smaller than two, oops, smaller than two N, and N here is of R, T, R. Yeah. Um, but let's, let's just suppress it. Then we have marginal trapped. Yeah, we know that this plus minus equals zero. And this is exactly if R equals to M. And, oh, sorry. Yeah, and trapped region is, that doesn't matter. Oops. Bigger than one. And this is if R bigger to M. Yeah, you see it has the same structure than, um, than a black hole, for example. And, um, but now we should also see the, um, yeah, so this is a future trend. Oops. It's a future trend. And we can see that there are two conditions. Uh, because when we when we say when we just plug in here, you see, when you plug for R to M, this will become zero. So we have a future trap, and this will become smaller zero. So it is kind of it is kind of uh, of obvious. You can just plug it in. You can just solve uh, this equal to zero, and then you will find that this is just two M. And um, from this, we can actually see that there is a much easier way of determining where the trapped region is. So we say we can just see this is equal to zero. And we can just write it down here in this metric. We see this, this is MTR over R. And this is the same. This is dr d mu r. You can calculate that. Uh, equals zero. We can you can see that this is the same. And that leads you to the following equation. You can check whether D, GRR is equal to zero. And then also you solve that with respect to the radius and you'll find that where your marginal trapped surface is. So this is the shortcut, but this only works for uh, spherical symmetric space times. And we can write down the lead rooms. So sorry that I have to be fast. Um, this is just given by the following object. So the R derivative respect to M over R square one plus time derivative of R. So R is in principle time, de uh, time dependent at the marginal trapped surface. And here we see we have an outer and an inner horizon when we fulfill two conditions. So if two DRM is smaller than one, the horizon is outer. And if two DRM is bigger than one, the horizon is inner. Yeah, because then uh, we have a sign change in the lead derivative at the marginal trapped surface. Of course, uh, this has to be uh, at MTS. This is also to be at MTS. So at that, um, at the horizon, we'll find that the lead derivative change sign depending on this thing, this object here. So then we can describe, for example, the nice logical inner black hole or the black hole outer horizon, or the, also the resonological outer horizon. It doesn't, it does not matter. It just depends on how, how you end the plane. Okay. Um, yeah. So I, I just want to make a final comment. Those dynamic horizons, as we can see, can be formulated in any geometry. It's most easy in the stoichiometric case, but there are um, the constructions foliation depending. But here, as you saw, what I did is I never 
use double null foliation. I just stayed with Pauli Gulstrand. And in this foliation, I could calculate all those quantities. And now, if you want, you can check it going to the double null, and you will find the exactly same result. You will find that um, this theta plus theta minus lies at exactly the same position. And um, this is a totally coordinate variant statement. There are a lot of articles which have been, which have showed that this is coordinate variant. They've used different coordinate gauges, and therefore this is a very powerful notion. And in principle here, as you, as you can see, uh, this condition here, r equals 2m, is time and radius dependence. So here we see the radius itself is also time dependence. So the position of the horizon now becomes dynamics. And um, in principle, it can have all coordinate um, uh, um, dependence. So that uh, yeah, it can move, it can rotate, it can you can you can use it for everything, and it's a very powerful notion. It's hard to construct, but well, once you have it, it is it is super nice. And you can do thermodynamics. That's actually what what I did uh, in an article, and you can show that for all those types of horizon, there is a Hawking effect. It looks differently depending on which uh, horizon you choose, but. Um, I just wanted to say there is a, also the thermodynamics of this for those who are interested in, in these things. And um, yeah, that's what I wanted to say. Thank you. Now you can ask questions. Uh, if you have any question, please ask Mark. Before that, for giving me such a nice talk, please give a clap for him. Unmute yourself and give a clap for him. <laughs> That's okay. Yeah. Uh, please ask questions. Uh, if you really want to ask, uh, because this is already uh, approximately two and a half hour talk. I yes. want to call yeah, it a totally. talk rather than I call it lecture. Uh, <laughs> because talk, if it is talk and it continues for two and a half hours, everybody will sleep. Okay. So I hope, hopefully a lot of people left because when I have uh, your talk started, it was 18, right now nine. I know. Yeah, I'm sorry, but uh, it was probably too, uh, too no, boring. No problem. I'm very happy that nine people are there because <laughs> they found this is interesting. Okay. Along with our expert, Vaishak. Because Vaishak was aware of this kind of thing from before, because he actually worked on this type of stuff. But I am sure that, uh, yeah, like maybe like few of the other people knows, but not everyone. But yeah, it was a really nice talk, and I will yes in YouTube and let you inform and. The, the problem I have suggested, we have to work on that. I know, yes. Yeah. And I, if, if some people are interested, I can send actual notes, which are nicer than what I wrote here. This uh, much more beautiful. Um, it's 222 pages of nice mathematics and construction. Okay. Nice so. The problem was, I told you, that people are feeling very lazy to learn new things. No, no, that's OK. And people wants to sell their own old, old products. Okay, and people need to think about uh, like uh, really is it a good idea or really they have to uh, redefine things or uh, re reformulate the whole story in a new language. Because I think there are a lot of changes have been made if you include this type of possibilities. I think so. I think it's a very powerful notion. Um, it's our gravitational perturbation theory. That would be highly effective. I think I think also it's, it's important yeah. to understand how to construct it because if you just know it on a, on a, on a yeah, let's say pedestrian level, you might run into traps the same as for the event horizon. So people uh, might 
think that there, there is something, but there's nothing. And uh, so I think it is really good to understand it on a, on a deeper level, but um, it is a lot of work. Yeah. I think Hannes and Vaishak have some questions, so they appeared with their face. <laughs> yes, that's right. I have to introduce, I don't need to introduce Hannes because Hannes and you are both from the same institute from, but from different department. But yes. Hannes and uh, Vaishak works on the similar uh, time, similar direction, not maybe the same topic, but numerical related. Okay, so Hannes, I have a question. Please, please, Hannes, ask. Yeah. Okay, so my question actually goes back to the event horizons, mm -hmm. and I wonder about uh, the definition of event horizons in the Zeta space. Exactly so. the same. <laughs> it's exactly the same definition. So, but in the Zeta, so you have an expanding universe, right? So no, um, no. Wait. When you take about, we talk about. You talk about the normal de sitter space time, the full de sitter, or you take talk about quasi de sitter. There are a lot of. What, things, like, what, is, what there, is the difference? The um, difference is. Yeah, yes, we can Hannes, please tell, tell, tell. Hannes, please tell. No, no, please. I don't really. You're the cosmologist. No. I mean. I, I was uh, very excited about de uh, sitter. That's why. You please tell. <laughs> what is the difference? In the Zeta, you can you can define a static patch, and uh, there you can define the same objects. Okay, um, like, so like, so you would look at a at a sub patch of your yeah. Uh, if you choose a Poincaré patch of the Zeta, then you have this uh, this quasi the Zeta, and this is a different story. Um, when you can even choose a full patch which is uh, static, and then you can define event horizon very, very easily. But when you look at the Poincaré, you get a dynamical one. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, so, for so this, I think static one. And therefore, the question is that therefore I ask what type of decider you mean, because sometimes, um, because in cosmology, people say uh, the sitter and they mean quasi the sitter, and sometimes they mean a point of a patch, and sometimes they mean the full I sitter. Feel, I have a feeling that Hannes is talking about Poincare patch because th that is related to the uh, that inflation story and those things. Okay, so yeah. Hannes is talking about the Poincare patch. So, can you comment about the Poincare yeah. patch? So, <clears throat> yeah, so you can show that um, in. FLW space times, which is this uh, Poincaré patch of the sitter, you cannot in all define an event horizon. So there is a proof that you can never define. For example, what, what you don't have is this asymptotic flatness. Yeah, because you sit at a, at a point and you have this uh, cosmological expansion and you cannot not define asymptotic flatness. So therefore, this definition uh, is not possible. The other thing is that it is in principle, then you, you can, that is the first problem. And uh, the other problem also occurs when you um, think about the, the um, yeah, that is actually dynamical. So you cannot wait until, it, it doesn't, yeah, you, yeah. you know. Um, so in that sense, um, there's a problem because you sit in the path of the singularity also. So um, there are a lot of issues which do not allow you to define good initial conditions. Because you cannot place your initial condition in the singularity and say, oh, I look at the, the, the future development of the singularity. That doesn't work that well. So in this sense, um, there are a lot of problems in, in, the, in this patch, yeah. OK. Um, yeah, thank you. And I have also a second question. No. Um, so you said something about uh, that these horizons, these dynamical horizons you talked about are invariant in some sense. Yes. So can you say in which sense they are invariant? Because so, um, mm -hmm. as far as I know, um, apparent horizons are foliation dependent. Oh, yeah, yeah. The construction is foliation dependent. That is 100% true. But the position of, a hori of the horizon is an invariant statement. So that there is a horizon or that there is no horizon that is invariant. 
and you can do perform a coordinate transformation and it will locate the, co the horizon at the same position mm -hmm. but so um, the statement is that it is invariant under coordinate transformation yeah so you cannot, for example, there are some, um, when you, for example, yeah, consider Minkowski, and then you do a boost, and you should get the, the, um, the Rindler coordinates, and you should get this horizon. But this horizon does not appear in this invariant statement. Uh, you will not be able to fulfill uh, theta plus theta minus equal zero. It, that's not possible in Minkowski, even if you choose different coordinates, because that is a totally coordinate independent. Even if you say, well, but I can construct the event horizon, I will never see dynamic horizon appearing there. Because th this would involve an eternal inflate, uh, an eternal uh, acceleration, but that's locally not measurable. So that is one example where, for example, or where you see that um, very, very good, you see very good that the, this cannot be um, assumed by any coordinate transformation, you cannot gauge it away or something. Mm -hmm. I have a question to Hannes. Yeah. Can I ask? Yeah. So if this dynamical horizon construction is true, then what would be the possible changes in the uh, like uh, measurement and observation in LIGO or the gravitational waves? What are the things we have to redefine or rethink or reformulate? Um, I think we don't have to reformulate much. I mean, we already use apparent horizons in numerical relativity. Um, so, yeah, I think there's no... So what is the no difference between that. apparent horizon and dynamical horizon? Involves um, asymptotic flatness. That is an assumption. That's an uh, assumption, which you don't need for uh, dynamical horizons. Okay. So for the black hole, it's totally fine to use an apparent horizon, okay. but for FLRW, you cannot because you cannot assume FLRW to be asymptotically flat. Hmm. That is the. So you need only two as a global assumption. This is orientability and time orientability. For the rest, for the apparent horizon, you need the, the additional thing to be asymptotically flat. But for, for black hole, for, for this okay. numerical relativity, it's totally fine, yeah. I can understand. Now, Vaishak, please, uh, sorry for uh, keeping you on wait. If Hannes don't have any other questions, sorry. No, for I'm, I'm finished. Uh, no, I don't have any question. I actually wanted to thank you for the uh, nice talk. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, so this was really nice. Yeah, so uh, uh, to uh, and also thank Shyanthan for organizing this because uh, such things can only be um, discussed if the uh, duration is more than an hour. Within an hour, it's difficult to cover some of these aspects. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's why people already told me that this is like. Uh, this is the motivation because I know that if you want to really learn and discuss, it will go more than an hour. Within an hour is basically if you want to do a business, then it is okay. Okay, go with your staffs and tell the tell the people that I did this, I didn't do this. Okay, so that for that this is one hour it is okay. But if you want to really tell what is the actual story and if you want to really learn then i think discussion is also important asking question participation everything is very important so that's why uh, it's like a little bit stretched and I, I i hope like all of you are actually enjoying uh, because like i feel that every after every talk we learn a lot of things and if you go home and look into all these stuffs a little bit, then I think you have a like very good picture on that thing. So at the end of the day, you may not say I'm the expert on that, but you can say, oh, I know this thing. Okay. Abhinash, do you have any question? Um, no, no, I don't have a question, but I really enjoyed the talk and especially this discussion. Can you Thank show you. your face? Because everybody's uh, appearing with their face. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. Hello. <laughs>
Hi. So, yeah, Abhinash is my student actually. Okay. So, okay. So, stay safe and healthy, Mark. So, yeah, uh, it's uh, you told that 20 degree centigrade temperature. I feel it is hot. <laughs> it is hot, yeah. Yeah. But it will going to be very cold very soon. Apparently, yeah. So, Hannes, are you going to the field for playing football? What? Today? No, no, I'm just asking. Usually after lunch, you go to the field and play with yourself. This myself. I mean, football is not allowed since, I don't know. Oh, this is um, not allowed. March. Oh, I got an email from Anika that there are some restrictions imposed from today. Is it so? Oh, okay, okay, okay. So hopefully things will be... Because like if it is locked down, then it is horrible. I can understand the situation. But yeah, like hopefully things will be fine. And uh, yeah, hope for the best. So stay safe and healthy. Bye. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. <clears throat>